Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on homelessness prevention in the midst of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Natalie Matthews, and I'm just going to spend a brief moment or two to get everybody oriented to the WebEx technology and get our event started today. So a um, few housekeeping tips for all of us. Uh, first and foremost, we are absolutely recording today's webinar. So if you would like at any point to view a recording of today's event, a copy of the slides, as well as a copy of the chat and the Q&A, we will be posting those to the HUD exchange within two to three business days. So just give us a little bit of time and we promise we will get those up there for you. Um, I also want to mention that if at any point you have any difficulty hearing the audio today, um, you are encouraged to switch from your computer audio to the toll-free number that is showing up on the screen right now, and that I will type in the Q or in the Q and A box and the chat box as well. So that 1-800 number, we find the, find the sound to be a little clearer, and that should help if you have any. Um, in terms of connecting with us today, um, all participants will be muted for the duration of our time together, so you won't be able to verbally ask your questions. However, we welcome your feedback, your questions, and your comments throughout, and encourage you to use the chat functionality in WebEx to send all of that information into us. So to find the chat functionality in WebEx, you should, uh, can just look in the center of your WebEx screen, and you should see several little icons. Um, one will look just like a chat bubble, and if you click on that, it will open up the chat functionality for you. And when you are sending in, again, those questions, comments, or um, points of feedback, please make sure that you are selecting all participants, and that will ensure that those messages get to both all attendees as well as um, to the presenters and to the team at SNAP today that's helping out. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Norm Sutar from HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. Thank you so much, Natalie, and thank you all for joining our conversation today about homelessness prevention. We have a lot of stuff we want to talk about today, uh, and we, there's a lot of content, and we know you'll have a lot of questions, so we're just going to jump right into things. Uh, I want to introduce our panelists very quickly. Uh, like Natalie said, I'm Norm Suchar. Uh, with the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, or the SNAPS office uh, at HUD. Uh, we will have presenting with us today uh, Regina Cannon from C4 uh, and Julie McFarlane, who's a technical assistance provider associated with Cloudburst Consulting. Uh, and we have a great uh, presentation from Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. So we'll have Kaylee Silver and Greg Barchuk, who are going to uh, give us a presentation about their, uh, some of their prevention programs. So we're very excited uh, to hear about uh, what you all are doing. So as we move on to the next slide, I want to just provide an overview of, of sort of where we are here. Uh, so the CARES Act resources, I always like to bring it back to sort of what is the overarching goal uh, of, of CARES Act resources. They are designed to prevent the spread of COVID and to reduce the harm caused by COVID. Uh, that includes uh, both sort of the harm to people's health and the harm that is inherent in an outbreak and also the uh, economic harm uh, that's caused when people lose their housing or experience homelessness. Uh, and what we've learned from the past uh, three months is that the safest place for people to be during this COVID epidemic and, and during epidem uh, epidemics in general is to be in housing uh, where they can isolate if they need to. Uh, we've also learned anybody can spread COVID, uh, and it is most likely to spread uh, in crowded indoor spaces. Uh, we have definitely seen this in emergency shelters with shared sleeping areas and where people are really in close quarters, uh, in places that lack uh, proper hygiene, uh, such as a lot of our homeless, and homeless encampments. Uh, so it, we're definitely trying to keep people uh, out of those scenarios uh, as much as possible. So moving on to the next slide, uh, we know that uh, COVID is more likely to affect uh, racial minorities, especially uh, black and indi indigenous people and other people of color. Uh, we know that it's more likely to affect uh, people who are elderly uh, and the consequences for people who are elderly are much, much worse. Uh, and it's more likely and has more negative con consequences for people who have health problems, especially if they're respiratory problems. Uh, 
So as we're thinking about how to prioritize assistance, those are all factors we should be thinking about very carefully. Uh, and we know that COVID has had a very severe impact, economic impact on our communities, uh, including just massive job loss, uh, increased housing stability, uh, increased risk of homelessness. Uh, these effects are also more likely to affect uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Uh, so again, things we need to think about uh, as we're moving forward. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, we are always thinking about how do we uh, use our resources as intelligently as possible and have to the maximum effect. Uh, yesterday had announced uh, the second allocation of CARES Act funding for the ESG CARES Act program. Uh, it was $2.96 billion. I'm pretty sure it's the largest single allocation of homelessness resources uh, in uh, U.S. history. Uh, which is a weird thing to say, but, um, you know, we need to think about how do we use these resources to the, to maximum effect. Uh, what we'll be talking a lot about today in the context of homelessness prevention is the importance of setting specific goals with respect to prevention and looking at people, uh, looking at trying to keep people out of high risk settings. So uh, unsheltered homelessness, particularly in encampments, uh, high-risk shelters that have shared sleeping areas. Uh, a lot of communities have been helping people move to non-congregate settings like hotel rooms and dorm rooms. So as people exit those settings, we obviously don't want them to go back to uh, homeless situations. Uh, and then we have a whole group of people who are sort of living on the edge of being able to pay rent. Uh, and how do we prevent their need from having to, to uh, their need to uh, come into the shelter system or to have to stay in unsheltered locations. And that will be very much the focus of the conversation today. So moving on to the next slide, please. Our objectives today, we want to understand the basic elements of a homelessness prevention strategy. Uh, we, wanna, we want you to be able to have tools to make good concrete decisions about how to plan and implement homelessness prevention programs in your community. Uh, and we want to give you examples of effective approaches to homelessness prevention. Uh, so very basic, like how do you do homelessness prevention well? So our agenda will include a review of prevention and rehousing strategy elements, uh, talking about uh, homelessness prevention resources. We want to walk through a framework of uh, prevention resources and how to think about targeting prevention. I think it's a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, and we're going to walk through a, just a very uh, basic hypothetical example of how you set prevention goals. For those of you who were on the rehousing webinar last week, that will hopefully, uh, we'll use the same kind of format. And then again, we're extremely excited uh, for our friends from Montgomery County, Pennsylvania to talk about uh, some of their prevention strategies. Uh, and so we'll have plenty of time for that. Moving on to the next slide. So this is just sort of a basic template of how to think about prevention and uh, setting up a prevention and rehousing strategy. Hopefully most of these elements will be pretty, uh, uh, pretty obvious to people. Uh, we used the same slide last week because it's the very same elements to coming up with a good plan, uh, working with the various change agents in your community, uh, and really reaching out a little farther to some of your, some of the non-traditional partners that could be helpful here. The CARES Act really put a lot of resources on the table in a, a lot of different areas and in some non-traditional ways. So bringing all those partners together so you can have a sort of a, a good, coherent, and comprehensive strategy is really helpful. Uh, and also, we're going to talk a lot about promoting equity. And one of the key elements of promoting equity in this uh, in this time is really identifying people who have been working on this and who have expertise in equity and serving uh, people of color and especially black and indigenous communities and bringing them to the table and having them uh, lead on local planning around uh, homelessness prevention. Uh, and of course, we have a huge public health component to this, so uh, we obviously want them to be part of the part of the planning and part of the solution. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about how to articulate a vision and, and set some goals. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, planning uh, and how you sort of 
turn a very, a bit, very basic vision into some concrete steps going forward, and we'll talk about implementation. Uh, and of course, everything's done with a mind toward evaluation and sort of this continuous quality improvement uh, and uh, mindset. So moving on to the next slide, <clears throat> two of the basic concepts that we'll be talking about uh, throughout this uh, webinar on prevention and that are really important to doing good prevention are effectiveness and efficiency. So effectiveness is basically do you, when you serve someone, do they not become homeless? So that it's pretty obvious that that's what we're going for is uh, when we serve a household, if they don't become homeless, that seems like uh, it's, it's what we want. Uh, and so that's an indicator of an effective program. Uh, but at the same time, it's really important to have efficient programs. And efficiency means you are serving people who, if you didn't serve them, they would experience homelessness. So one of the things we see a lot in homelessness prevention programs is that uh, a lot of them serve people who really wouldn't have been, wouldn't have become homeless in the absence of the, uh, of the intervention. So it's really easy to look great on paper when you uh, serve a lot of people who would not have become homeless and you measure and they didn't become homeless. You know, it, it looks great, uh, but Really, we want to be able to combine both these notions of effectiveness and efficiency. And I think we understand effectiveness much better. Efficiency in a lot of ways is much more challenging and it requires much more uh, thought and data analysis and a lot better uh, coordination with, uh, with other partners. Uh, so we're going to be talking a lot about that today. So let's go on to the next slide. So this is just, uh, you know, a super professional Venn diagram of thinking about efficient and inefficient programs. So the circle, the gray circle is sort of the large group of people who are at risk of homelessness, who we generally think of as at risk of homelessness. Uh, you know, generally people in poverty who pay, you know, more than half their income for rent and have other sort of risk factors uh, that, that might lead to homelessness. And the yellow dot is the people who actually become homeless uh, from that group. So we know that there are a lot of people who are sort of in a broad at-risk category, but the vast majority of them don't experience homelessness. So what's going on there? Uh, and uh, so that's the yellow group. And, and our challenge with thinking about how to target prevention and make it efficient is that blue dot. Is that blue dot you know, completely separate from the group of people who would actually experience homelessness? Or, you know, in the second example, the example of an efficient targeting mechanism, is, is, is there a pretty good overlap with the uh, people who are, who are um, really actually going to experience homelessness? Uh, and that's how we know we have an efficient, uh, an efficient prevention program. So uh, moving on to the next slide, I uh, am now going to introduce uh, Julie McFarland, uh, uh, one of our guest presenters, who's going to talk about different types of prevention. So Julie, take it away. Okay, thank you, Norm. Hi, everybody. I am Julie McFarland. I'm excited to be talking about targeted prevention today, as so many communities that I've been talking with recently are really grappling with some tough decisions and are asking for guidance. So I'm gonna talk about prevention strategies, starting with primary prevention, which aims to reduce individual and structural risk factors that contribute to homelessness and increase protective factors that shield against homelessness. Today, we'll dig into two specific types of primary prevention strategies, the selected group strategy and the indicated group strategy. And there's something I really wanna emphasize before we dive into that. The language we're using today isn't the most important thing to take away. It, so if possible, try to avoid getting caught up in the language because it's likely new and focus more on the concepts that we cover. What's really important is that there are effective and efficient ways to do targeted homelessness prevention. And there's some really great opportunities in front of us to do this well. So when you're making these decisions locally, the concepts that we cover today should give you a framework of what to consider and what not to consider. Next. All right, so let's dig in with some definitions. 
We're going to focus less on universal strategies today. Uh, universal strategies provide protection to a broad array of people who might be at risk of homelessness. These include public benefit programs, um, affordable housing development, education and employment programs. So specifically things like TANF, like food stamps, housing choice vouchers, affordable housing development. Selected group strategy, um, these, this targets housing assistance to those who face significant structural barriers that make loss of housing more likely. So within the selected group strategy, we target assistance to populations who are at higher risk of homelessness. For example, people who live in high poverty neighborhoods or who are exiting from institutional care. Selected group strategies can include prioritizing resources for households that fall into one of the groups identified by your local data as being the most likely to become homeless. I've seen some great comments in the chat already around how you figure that out and we have some tips for you. It might mean people living in neighborhoods where there's a high percentage of shelter residents uh, who, um, where shelter residents live before they were experiencing homelessness, it might be individuals with criminal justice histories, households that move frequently in the past year, households with children under two years old, uh, or households involved with child protective services. Those are just some specific examples that you really need to look at your local data to better understand uh, the, the, the local situation. Indica indicated group strategies. Uh, this targets households that are likely to enter emergency shelter or an unsheltered situation because of individual circumstances. That might be fleeing partner or domestic violence, experiencing a health problem, or being evicted from housing. So together, we're going to walk through these two strategies, the selected group strategy and the indicated group strategy, and offer up some specific examples. Go to the next slide. So let's jump into the selected group strategies. As mentioned, the goal of selected group strategies is to keep marginalized populations housed, targeting assistance to those who likely face significant structural barriers that make loss of housing more likely for them. We know that if this is correctly designed, if it's adequately resourced, and if it's informed by people who are most impacted, these strategies will reduce racial disparities in who experiences homelessness in your community. The target population are groups or populations of people with particularly high risk of homelessness as members of a protected class. So in determining target populations, you have to know your local data and you've got to engage with the communities who are most impacted. If you do not yet have this data or these relationships, we really recommend that you use a racial equity impact assessment, which we're going to link for you in the chat. This will help you begin the work and you should continuously use these tools as you plan, design and implement new strategies and as you adapt them over time. And both the National Alliance to End Homelessness and HUD have made tools available to analyze your local data for racial disparities and they're really useful. So some key partnerships within this selected group strategy include people with lived experience, civil and legal aid or eviction courts, advocacy organizations, and nonprofits that are primarily led by people of color and primarily serving the selected target population that you have identified. When you're looking at your data and determining the target population, you want to identify the most disproportionately impacted communities rather than all marginalized populations. It's like you have to start somewhere intentional and this really gives you the opportunity to have the greatest impact. So really hone in on your data and identify the most disproportionately impacted communities and we recommend starting there. So let's go to some specific examples, get really concrete with this. As Norm told you, we're going to feature Montgomery County, Pennsylvania in a little bit here uh, because they've implemented a selected group strategy. So I'm going to skip that for now. Just know that we'll have a great detailed example coming up shortly. Uh, New York, New York City's home based program. So if you've read any of the prevention studies that are out there, you have heard about them. They use data to target households who are most likely to experience homelessness including geocoding to identify hotspots of shelter demand, which is how they actually determined where a prevention pilot should start. It's a neighborhood-based strategy and it's based on their, who their data tells them is most likely to become homeless. So it's a little bit older from its inception in 2004 until 2007, communities where this prevention pilot occurred 
showed a lower rate of increase in shelter entry than a comparison group of similar communities without a home-based prevention pilot. Um, and when comparing the rate of increase in shelter to the comparison group, shelter entry rates would have been expected to rise by about 37%, but instead the rate increased by 27%, which was a substantial 10% difference. So based on these early results, they implemented four new programs and expanded citywide coverage in 2008. And since, they, since some time has passed, they have really good data showing that um, they know that over 90% of households served by the home-based prevention program did not enter shelter within one year of that service. In Columbus, Ohio, they use data to target assistance geographically where there are high proportions of people who are impacted by racism and poverty. So there, in an effort to advance equity and implement targeted prevention strategies, the Linden neighborhood was selected for a focused prevention effort as a pilot community. And the current focus is to target assistance geographically where there are high proportions of black and African American residents and poverty. Regina, I think you have another example to share as well. I'd love to. Good afternoon, everyone. And so I want to share an example with you um, of a local neighborhood here in my city of Atlanta. And this prevention program actually started in a shelter. And so this shelter, they were seeing an increasing number of black female head of households coming into the shelter. And they began to talk to the folks to try to find out what's going on, what's behind all of this. And so they found out that if they asked, where were you uh, last most stably housed, rather than where were you last night, that they started to see a pattern, that these women were all coming from the same zip code. And not only from the same zip code, but they were coming from three cluster neighborhoods. And they said, gosh, we need to see what's going on here. And so not only finding out that this particular area had a higher number of evictions of black female head of households, it was also in one of the most distressed areas of the entire state. This was a place that had been under resourced for a long time. And not surprisingly, it was over 80% black um, that lived in that neighborhood. And so they came together and said, well, we need to have a prevention program here. And so they put together funds from the, from the city and from one of the local foundations to begin to target that specific neighborhood, those three cluster neighborhoods for, for a prevention strategy, saying that we can at least prevent the evictions because we're seeing the end of it here. And so that's just a local example that started from really going into a little bit more detail and sitting and talking to folks when they had entered shelter. Great, thank you. Let's go to the next slide. So for the moment, we're gonna move from selected group strategies to indicated group strategies. So as a reminder, the goal is to keep people housed who are likely to have to stay in emergency shelter or enter an unsheltered situation because of individual circumstances. This is most efficient at preventing homelessness and requires use of an assessment tool to, I should say it often requires use of an assessment tool to determine who is most likely to experience homelessness. So in, in determining the target population, risk and predictive factors should be identified using your local data, using characteristics of the households entering your emergency shelter system. This strategy is targeting those most likely to experience homelessness, but for the assistance. So key partnerships often include people with lived experience, health clinics, schools, religious leaders, and criminal justice partners as a couple of examples. In this particularly unique moment in time with your local COVID response, it's also an opportunity to ensure that the program is designed to provide the assistance or services that will be needed to prevent homelessness for people who are at high risk of homelessness or at high risk of COVID severe symptoms or death. I also want to note, we're going to talk a few, about a few COVID specific examples in a moment. I just want to note that this may be more than one time assistance and that's something to consider locally as you're planning and designing. When someone received prevention assistance in the past and it's clear that additional support will be needed to maintain housing and avoid entering shelter or an unsheltered situation, you've really got to have a community plan for how you will respond to that. Let's go to the next slide. So to speak to a couple of questions that have come in so far, how do you know who is most likely to experience homelessness but for that assistance? 
there are some common risk factors that we have uh, been able to identify over time through multiple pilots and projects and studies. And utilizing these helps us be as efficient as possible. So common risk factors include households who have eviction proceedings initiated, families with young head of household, households in a doubled up situation, households who are losing their homes or have an eviction threat, and recently lost employment in a sector impacted substantially by COVID-19 shutdowns. Individuals who exit institutions like detentions, jails, prisons, or hospitals, and individuals who age out of foster care. The most common pathways into homelessness are exits from an institutional setting or from a doubled up arrangement. So people who have experienced homelessness in the past are more likely to experience it in the future. That is very commonly known. And we're going to talk more about that later. Some other risk factors include foster care involvement and criminal justice involvement. Um, and we're just encouraging you to use this information about common pathways to inform you around how you might create targeted strategies and identify what risk factors you're going to look at. As mentioned, this is an opportunity to apply COVID specific risk as a screening factor. And this is something to consider as one way to really ensure that your shelters are de-intensified so social distancing is possible and so people are safe. Um, I've heard a few communities have conversations recently about adding screening questions related to COVID and who's most vulnerable to its severe symptoms and death per the latest CDC guidance. And then finally, there are a few specific screening tools that have been um, really helpful in informing local planning and design. And uh, one of those is SSCF. They have done a lot of work on the veteran side of things to develop that tool. Um, and also Washington State has a targeted prevention screening tool. Let's go to the next slide. We identified one risk factor as households who have eviction proceedings initiated, and there's a resource that we want to make sure folks are aware of. Regina, would you mind sharing some info about the eviction lab? Absolutely. So one of the ways that you can make sure that you're finding out about evictions that are going on in specific communities, you can go to the eviction lab and it's on Princeton University's website and I think that we're going to chat that in. Um, another place is to go to your sheriff's department because they're the ones who actually uh, initiate. So you can pull the data from there. Another place to go to as well, uh, there are typically law students that are in part of their clinics for the second year and they're pulling that data as well. There are um, housing courts. So depending on what community that you're in, you can also go to a housing court and have that data pool. So it's pretty, it's pretty simple to go and make sure that you know where exactly most of the um, evictions are taking place in your specific neighborhood. And I'd also just like to add an example um, of another strategy. One of the things that Julie mentioned earlier was around um, exits from institutions. And I wanna share an example of folks that are coming out of jails at a high rate from specific neighborhoods. And so um, I, I hate to keep talking about my, my own city here, Atlanta, uh, but I know it so well. Um, that we were working with the court system here and we um, were going through tons of data and we discovered that there was a zip code 30318. If you mention that zip code to anyone in Georgia, they know exactly what you're going to say next. It is the place where most folks who are coming out of jails, who are coming out of prisons come back to. That is the place that is buying city um, as part of the uh, Atlanta. And so we began to work with some of the uh, probation parole officers around the community, uh, some of the local courts, and we put together what was called an impact, a community impact program, so that we could target those specific neighborhoods in 30318 because we knew that most of the folks that were coming back from that, from that zip code, that's where they had lived previously, they were going to be homeless. And we were able to double check that with the shelters that when the zip codes were indicated, guess what we were seeing? That it was that 30318 zip code when folks were coming out of prisons and jails. And so that's another way that we can make sure that we're trying to provide as much housing and preventive prevention for those that are exiting institutions. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, so a couple of additional examples. Uh, I mentioned the Washington State Targeted Prevention Screening Tool that assesses risk factors and rehousing barriers to prioritize populations at greatest risk of experiencing literal homelessness. And I think we're gonna link that for you in the chat. During this COVID response specifically, 
um, private dollars have been made available to Omaha, Nebraska's homeless system, and they began using risk factors based on HPRP learning, uh, the SSBF screening tool and learning, and some community-based research that's available. Uh, they also have a screening question about COVID risk, as we talked about a moment ago, um, so, that, um, so that's really an option to support local efforts to de-intensify their shelters. Uh, one other example is Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they, their homelessness prevention network is screening households for their risk level utilizing a four-question screening tool. And that has been formally validated and tested and provides for web-based functionality that can quickly identify what risk category the household is in. Let's go to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me, all right. This is the final strategy we wanna highlight and that's the secondary prevention strategy. This is commonly referred to as diversion. Uh, this is important because households seeking shelter are the most likely to experience literal homelessness. So the goal of secondary prevention is to provide a safe alternative for people who are seeking shelter or who are moving into an unsheltered situation. Um, it prevents prolonged experiences of homelessness and avoids unnecessary shelter stays, which really preserves shelter and homeless housing resources for households who have no other safe alternatives. The target population is obviously people at the front door of the homeless response system at the point that they are seeking shelter or facing unsheltered homelessness. They are at a shelter door asking for a spot tonight. Maybe they're calling a hotline to find out about shelter availability, or they engage with an outreach worker as they are facing unsheltered homelessness tonight. Key partnerships within this secondary prevention strategy include people with lived experience, coordinated entry teams, emergency shelter, shelter providers, and nonprofits primarily led by people of color and primarily serving populations facing the greatest disparities. So often secondary prevention programs will identify short-term solutions, such as staying with a family member or a friend, or delaying an eviction for a couple of weeks while working with a person on a more permanent solution. If you aren't currently applying these problem-solving techniques and having these conversations um, through a secondary prevention approach across your homeless system, you're likely missing opportunities to identify safe alternatives to shelter um, and unsheltered homelessness for a large number of people. This is a huge opportunity to reduce the trauma experienced by people in a housing crisis and really to reduce your homeless system inflow. There's a lot of federal resources that can be plugged into this approach as well, so it's really a critical time for this type of decision making. I also wanted to mention HUD's recent study on market predictors of homelessness. It indicates that overcrowding has the highest anticipated effect on homelessness followed by unemployment and then eviction. Mm -hmm. Targeting prevention dollars to secondary prevention strategies before other prevention efforts will really increase the efficiency of prevention, ensuring that your resources go as far as possible and prevent homelessness for households who otherwise would have become homeless. Next slide. Regina, I think you also have an example of secondary prevention to share. Yeah, absolutely. One of the partnerships that I want you all to consider is working alongside your communities of faith. So if there are local churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, because that's where a lot of people will go first, um, you know, before even coming to the front door of a shelter. And guess what? You've got a lot of parishioners there that are counselors and mediators. Sometimes they can do some mediation and make sure that a person has or a family has a place to stay over a couple of days until they can get back on their feet. Uh, so they never have to enter the shelter system. You've got folks um, within those parishioners, those parishioners that may have jobs. They may have apartments, you know, over their garages or places where people can stay, um, especially and, and keep those families together. So make sure that you're utilizing those large communities of faith that already have programs and outreach programs because a lot of people will, will be going to them first. And so to set up partnerships with them as part of your prevention and diversion strategy. Great, thank you. There was an ask to repeat those three indicators from HUD's market study, so I'll do that really quick. It indicated that overcrowding has the highest anticipated effect on homelessness, followed by unemployment and then eviction. Okay, so I wanna provide a couple of other examples, examples um, in addition to what Regina shared. Uh, in both Missoula and Great Falls, Montana, 
they have developed what they call a centralized diversion fund for people at the front doors of their system. So that emergency shelters, drop-in centers, outreach, other front doors. So when they engage in a problem solving conversation and folks identify a safe housing option outside of the homeless system, they work with folks to make that solution a reality. And if flexible funds or a resource needed to make that solution a reality, the problem solving specialist who's working with the person contacts the administrator of the centralized fund, lets them know the need and has the resource in hand with 24, within 24 to 48 hours. So quick turnaround. Similarly, in Washington, D.C., at the Virginia Williams Family Research Resource Center, shelter diversion is embedded within their central intake process. And the primary objective is to identify safe alternatives to shelter at the time that they're doing shelter intake. Secondary prevention is a racial equity strategy. Many communities have actually taken steps to strategically place their coordinated entry access points or those front doors in locations that are more likely to reach communities that are most disproportionately impacted by homelessness. So indigenous people, black and African American people, LGBTQIA plus populations. If you're doing this type of problem solving at your front doors, the secondary prevention, that is fantastic. Uh, prevention, this is, this is a service that we want to offer all people who are at the front doors of a homeless system who don't have a safe place to stay tonight. And it's extremely low barrier and it's flexible. And when you've implemented this, staff who have been doing the direct work typically think it's a great service to offer everyone uh, because they are feeling like they are helping more people in real time because they truly are. Then when, when your community looks to do some type of primary prevention work, it can be a bit of a shift. So I just wanna call that out because I learned that lesson alongside a community recently. Make sure that as you plan and you design and you implement a primary prevention strategy like indicated group strategy that might require something like a screening tool, that your direct service folks understand why it's so targeted and more narrowly focused because that's considerably different than the secondary prevention strategy that focuses on anyone coming to the front door of your shelter system, for example. That buy-in is super critical to successful implementation, something that feels important to call out. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Norm. Great, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna just take a deep breath here because I think we just like communicated uh, possibly the most prevention content that has been communicated in a 37 minute period ever. So uh, I know there's a lot of, we've thrown a lot of information out there. Uh, we have also put a lot of links up to different documents in the chat. Uh, so I wonder, I'm gonna ask a favor of our uh, TA providers, if you, uh, if you could put in the instructions for how to download the chat, because I know people are like trying to catch the links and um, and sometimes they go off the page before they get a chance. So I know there's, an, there's a simple way to sort of just download the whole thing. So uh, we'll, we'll put that up so you can get all that. But to, to just run through some of the resources that we've mentioned, and we'll have a slide a little later on that summarizes some of the research, uh, resources as well. Uh, there's a great study from the California Policy Lab about homelessness in Los Angeles. It walks through how they did the data analysis to figure out what the risk factors were in Los Angeles. Uh, there's a great resource from the Center for Evidence-Based Solutions uh, that was just published about a year ago uh, that has that just walks through what is known about homelessness prevention and talks about some of the major risk factors. Uh, Julie mentioned the Market Predictors of Homelessness uh, study that we had, that had uh, did. I wanna uh, make clear that those were looking at community level risk factors. So they were trying to identify what, um, which cities are more likely to have more homelessness than others. Uh, and uh, very importantly found that uh, actually by a long way, overcrowding was a really important predictor. Uh, if you are a state who is trying to figure out where in your state to locate prevention assistance, uh, that is a good example of how to sort of identify where in all your geography should we be uh, placing our prevention assistance? Look for the places with high levels of overcrowding. Uh, so those are just, and then the eviction lab, I think has been posted a, a couple times and somebody uh, also just posted the, the National Alliance to End Homelessness, uh, just published a blog post about homelessness prevention. 
uh, we will try to get that link up as well. Uh, so a lot of resources out there. So I want to sort of uh, switch into something uh, of, uh, well, some more content about this. And, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, pitfalls of prevention. Uh, and one of the major pitfalls we see, and, and we saw this during HPRP, and I, we're, we're seeing a little uh, these days around homelessness prevention, uh, is that uh, there's a lot of interest in just setting very, very broad targeting for prevention. Like if somebody's eligible, let's just help, let's just provide prevention. Uh, so we, we put in this slide an example of like the, the black circle is like, why don't you just try to draw a circle around as many uh, people at risk as possible? And so we just wanted to walk through like what the problem with that is. I know that many of you in your communities are, are being very thoughtful about prevention and so you're getting pushback from your political leaders and other stakeholders about like just throw the uh, doors wide open. Uh, and I think so, so in this chart we're showing like the, the you know, a, a targeting approach that is very, very broad, not very targeted. Uh, and we're looking at the blue circle is the people actually served by a prevention program. And one thing I really want to talk through is, well, what does that mean for all those people who are eligible but who don't get served, right? Because there's a, there's a downside to a prevention program where you have a lot of people who apply but ultimately don't get assistance, right? First of all, so that all that gray and yellow space that is not covered in that blue circle, right? Those are all people who, like, you sort of, like, gave an indication that they would be eligible for prevention, and they spent some time uh, an effort to try and get uh, to apply for assistance. Uh, they may have, you know, had to go someplace or, or you know, uh, spend time online or whatever to try and apply for assistance. Uh, there's a good chance that your, your prevention system will get overwhelmed by requests, right? It's uh, not great to have a lot of a lot more applicants than you are able to um, than you are able to help. Uh, it is certainly the strategy of Ivy League universities, but uh, speaking, I'm sure many of you have like uh, been down that road and it's just not a great way to do business. Uh, you lose the trust of your, uh, of your population when you uh, sort of promise assistance or promise the availability of assistance that you are unable to deliver. When you have broad targeting and you aren't able to deliver assistance, who does usually get assistance? It is primarily people who have the time to apply, who are good self-advocates, who have resources like good computer connections, access to transportation. Those are all things that are actually uh, contra-indicators of homelessness. So those are people who are less likely to experience homelessness, right? Those are all indicators of, that you are able to sort of put together, uh, use your social networks well to get resources. Uh, and so you're by throwing your sort of targeting wide open, you're likely to actually do a worse job of serving, uh, of serving people who are most likely to become homeless than if you just sort of like randomly picked people to, uh, to get assistance. So what we really want is for that black circle to be as close as possible to the blue circle. So, you know, the people we're targeting are the people who are applying and are the people we're serving. So let's move on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so I want to walk through, like, what does a plan look like? How do you, what are the big steps? And we're just going to do an example of, uh, of what a plan might look like. So uh, the planning steps, obviously, we're going to think about our goals first. Everything is goal driven. Uh, we're going to design an approach that meets our goal, right? So we're going to think through all the program design elements that are going to be required to achieve that goal. Uh, we're going to think about our resources and what uh, where, what funding do we have that can help achieve the goal? And then we're going to do this sort of matching of our, uh, our goal, our resources, our program design, our public messaging, our data, our accountability, all that stuff, uh, and create an effective prevention program. So let's go to the next slide, please. So we're going to start with coming up with some goals. And there's no magic to these goals. We just wanted to uh, give some examples, and I think we've talked about some of these uh, examples in the in the presentation, and we'll have uh, even more afterwards. But 
let's say you have a goal of you want to prevent uh, prevent 200 people from experiencing homelessness in a particular zip code because you went to the eviction lab, you went to your local court uh, uh, a site and you found out that that's where all the evictions were. Uh, and also of school data is another, you know, uh, data source, like schools often have an understanding of uh, where people are likely to experience homelessness. Uh, so you, you, you want to uh, prevent homelessness for 200 people in that zip code. Um, then you want to uh, be able to do a diversion program. Julie talked very, uh, and Regina talked very nicely about secondary prevention approaches. So you want to implement one of those. You're going to try to serve uh, 600 households there. And uh, you have people who are coming out of corrections, either jail or prison, maybe because the, uh, the, uh, the jails and prisons are depopulating a little bit because of COVID or maybe for other reasons. Uh, and so you're going to serve 60 people coming out of it. So we have some concrete goals here, right? So let's go to the next slide, please. Next thing we're going to do is look at our resources. Uh, we just got a second allocation of uh, ESG funding. Uh, so, uh, you know, our fictional town is Springfield here. We have ESG, we have uh, in two rounds, we have CDBG and we have some FEMA resources. Uh, so you, you will likely have a lot of other resources that you're looking at, but we're just going to sort of make a short list here. And let's go to the next slide, please. So now we're going to like think through our, our, our program design uh, and like think through what are we, how are we going to make this thing work uh, and match our population, right? So. Uh, so our first uh, project type is going to be homelessness prevention. Uh, we are going to look at, it's a, we're going to use the selected group strategy of identifying people in a particular neighborhood, that's zip code 12345. Um, we're trying to understand what our monthly caseload is. This is going to help us, like, identify how many caseworkers do we need to hire, how much capacity are we going to need. We want to think through average duration because we want to, set expectations for the people we're serving. And also, uh, if your average duration is going to be two months, then you need a case management plan that happens over two months, right? So you're trying to match all these elements of your program design. We're going to look at the average monthly cost, and then often there are sort of fixed costs to a program or, or just one-time costs. So we're going to add that all up. We're going to come up with a, a, an average cost. Uh, there's nothing magic to these average costs, by the way. Uh, they're, I think, reasonable given the program types, but this is going to vary a lot from community to community. And we also want to think about uh, equity considerations in each of our strategies. What we know is that if you don't think about it, you're like, you're going to, you're not going to do well. So you always want to be thinking about the equity strategies that you're going to uh, implement. And uh, in this case, you know, our, our zip code, uh, we looked at the, um, uh, the racial composition of the zip code we're focused on, make sure we are targeting places that are disproportionately impacted by homelessness. Uh, and so going to the next one, we're going to look at a, um, uh, a, sorry, not the next slide, the next row. Can we go back a slide? Sorry about that. Uh, we're going to look at our secondary prevention strategy of doing diversion for people coming uh, that are seeking homeless assistance. Uh, so again, we're looking at a monthly caseload. Uh, that's probably pretty high because we have very short assistance. Often it's actually less than a month. Uh, how much financial assistance we're giving, one-time cost, things like that. Uh, and we're going to focus here very much, and this is really important for a diversion program especially. You're trying to uh, have a relationship with someone very quickly. Uh, so you want someone who has a lot of competence and experience working with the population you're working with. So you're really going to uh, uh, want agencies that have experience working with black indigenous uh, populations and people of color, uh, that's going to be really important to the success of the program. So those are design elements there. And then we're going to, you know, look at our, uh, our incarceration, uh, people exiting incarceration strategy. We're going to probably going to have a lower uh, caseload for that. We're probably going to require uh, a little longer term uh, you know, maybe two months of assistance, uh, maybe, you know, $1,500 a month. Again, uh, often it'll, I think it'll be a little more than that, but for the purposes of this, we use those, those numbers. Sometimes we put in numbers here to make the math a little easier. Uh, but it, we're also going to look at, 
who are the employers who have a good track record of hiring, uh, again, black, indigenous, and people of color, uh, because those are employers we're going to want to work with, right? And uh, also not just a good track record of hiring, but a good track record of retention and like career pathways and things like that. We're going to work, want to work with employers who, uh, who are good at working with uh, the population we're working with. So, uh, so those are important equity considerations. So let's go to the next slide again, please. Now we're just matching up our resources to our strategy. So we have our first uh, strategy, our neighborhood-based strategy. Uh, when you cost out all the stuff we did, the, um, uh, we had, uh, it's going to cost about $880,000. We're going to use CDBG CARES Act funding for about 440,000 of that, uh, and ESG phase two funding for about 440,000 of that. Uh, so, again, I think everyone knows how to use a spreadsheet and sort of map funding to these different uh, strategies, but this is re a really important part of the process. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a lot of pressure to move quickly, and we want to move quickly, but I think it's uh, important. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think you'll get your programs up and running faster uh, if you really have a good sense of, like, which allocation of funding is going to which activity. Uh, and that you fund to your goal, right? Again, we don't want to set a goal of serving a thousand households and we actually only have resources for a hundred, right? You're going to uh, disappoint a lot of people. And, and at the end of the day, you're actually going to undermine confidence in your ability, right? Like if most of the people who you wanted to serve didn't get served, right? That's, that's not confidence inspiring. So uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So I am very, very pleased to uh, now introduce our guest uh, speakers today. Uh, we have Kaylee Silver and Greg Barchuk. Uh, and so, Kaylee, I'm going to turn things over to you and uh, very excited to hear about the great work you guys have been doing in Montgomery County. Kaylee? Great. Thank you so much and thank you to everyone for inviting us on this uh, webinar. My name is Kaylee Silver. I am the interim senior manager for Your Way Home Montgomery County. To give a little bit of context, we're a large suburban county right outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm going to talk you through sort of our journey into prevention programs. So I think we should go to the next slide, please. Great. So um, in 2017, uh, we and one of our philanthropic partners, HealthSpark Foundation, partnered with uh, uh, Barbara Poppy as a consultant to help us take a look at how to uh, implement best practice and impactful homelessness prevention programs in our community. Um, of note, she first took a look at our core homeless crisis response system and uh, felt strongly, and I agree that, you know, you want to make sure that your intervention strategies and rehousing strategies are really strong. Um, and that way you can use that data to help inform your upstream and prevention strategies. So she took a uh, look at our data along with our data manager, Greg Barchuk, who will speak a little bit more about that in just a minute, um, and actually recommended uh, three pilots uh, based on a scan of best practices based on our and our local data. Uh, the first uh, the first suggestion was to launch a court-based eviction prevention program. Uh, which we did, and we call it the Eviction Prevention and Intervention Coalition, or EPIC for short. That was launched in 2018, and I'll talk more about that program in a minute. Uh, and then the second one was a school-based homelessness prevention program to target uh, students with a high rate, of high rate of mobility and high McKinney-Vento numbers and do a rehousing uh, and stabilization model for them. Uh, we launched that as a pilot in in school year 2018-2019, uh, and we call that the Sprout Initiative. And again, I'll go more into detail on that program in a minute. Uh, she did recommend in the report, which you can access uh, by visiting our website at yourwayhome.org, and the full report is called Unlocking Doors, um, a third uh, strategy, which is a universal screening tool and targeted prevention. We have not fully launched that yet as a pilot or a program. However, we are now with ESG CV funding uh, looking to launch an impactful uh, emergency rent coalition with targeted prevention emergency rent. Um, I'm going to stop here before we advance to the next slide and punt it to our data manager, Greg Barcha, 
to just talk a little bit more about the data process that went into the whole um, Unlocking Doors uh, best practice study. Hi, everyone. As Kaylee mentioned, my name is Greg Barchuk. I'm the data manager for Your Way Home. Um, and I want to just step back for a second and acknowledge something that's really not a surprise to anyone at this time, and that's that uh, people of color and particularly uh, black and African American residents are overrepresented in the homelessness system. That's particularly true in Montgomery County. We are a county that is predominantly white. Our white population is 80%. Our black population is only 10%. And yet our homeless population is over 51% black. Um, we also know that our black and African American population tends to live in certain communities in um, in our county, uh, Norristown and Pottstown, uh, and to a lesser extent, Lansdale as well. Uh, so as we were digging into our data and, and discovering that, we were also working with Barbara and looking at our uh, eviction data. And so we partnered with Legal Aid to look at the eviction data by zip code, as other folks on this call have mentioned, and saw that the highest numbers of evictions in Montgomery County happen in Norristown and then in Pottstown and to a lesser extent in Lansdale. Um, so these, these two things are not um, disconnected from each other. We know that the factors that lead to homelessness push harder on people of color, particularly on black and African-American residents, on women and on families with children. Um, I mentioned that because we noticed that 23% of all individuals experiencing homelessness in Montgomery County are black children. Um, so as I mentioned, we saw that our, our evictions were concentrated in these communities where we see higher uh, percentages of folks who are black or African American. In fact, 60% of all of the evictions in Montgomery County happen in only two zip codes, in Norristown and in Pottstown. Um, and then also we, we looked at our county schools and saw that um, there were higher rates of student mobility in these communities as well. So that was what led to us starting to look at uh, launching prevention projects in more targeted places than simply, you know, something that was uh, widely open to anyone in the community. We wanted to focus our efforts where it was going to have the greatest impact. Great. Thank you. Next slide, please. So to go a little bit more into our court-based eviction prevention program, uh, the project concept was uh, to provide free limited legal representation, social services, and financial assistance to tenants facing eviction in geographically targeted areas of the county, as Greg mentioned. We uh, got that zip code data uh, in partnership with Legal Aid and our local bar association and foundation. Uh, they were two very key partners in, um, in forming EPIC and launching EPIC. Uh, we also partnered with our county court administration uh, and then a housing social services provider that had expertise in uh, rapid rehousing. Um, we, uh, in our first year, served about 120 households, and we had uh, over an 80% success rate, which we'll go into in just a minute. Um, it leverages case management and social services administration, legal aid services, and uh, we also utilize the services of pro bono lawyers uh, that are organized through our local bar association. Um, we, uh, we, were in, we launched this uh, by funding it through local fair dollars through Pennsylvania, which are state dollars for us, as well as private philanthropic support. Um, and, our, and some county uh, affordable housing trust fund support as well to provide the case management assistance. Um, and the next slide will show us a little bit of the impact of EPIC. Actually, sorry, my apologies, not just yet. Um, no, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. So the key components of the EPIC program include the legal representation and social services. It uh, launched in one municipal district court in 2018, uh, and we expanded uh, in early 2020 to a second municipal district court. We now consider EPIC a full uh, running program. Uh, we have legal representation on site and same day, uh, offered by pro bono lawyers or uh, legal aid lawyers. Um, and free CLEs are offered to the lawyers who are signing up and volunteering their time. 
Uh, the social services provides uh, intake and assessment. They complete housing stability plan and budgets, uh, and they help distribute the financial assistance, if appropriate, up to $1,500 per household. They also manage data entry into HMIS and provide case management for the next 30 days. Next slide. And I'll hand it back over to Greg again to talk a little bit about the impact that EPIC has had. Yeah, so we were really pleased to see that EPIC was a very successful pilot. Um, of the 81 households that we worked with in the first year, 78 um, were prevented in, um, I'm sorry, uh, of the 81 households that we worked with, um, we looked at 78 households. There were three that um, their eviction hearing was delayed, so we took those out of the, the report that we uh, worked on. Of the 78, 85% of those evictions were successfully prevented, um, and that included over 90% of evictions faced by households headed by a woman of color. Um, the, the lens that we used to analyze the EPIC report um, was uh, reflective of not just that, um, you know, we were aware that there are racial disparities in these cases, but also the intersections between race and gender. And so we wanted to look at our household, not just by, um, you know, is this a household headed by a, an African-American or a white person, um, but what is the, the gender component there? Part of the reason for that was we wanted to also look at rent burden. Um, and so we saw that um, our households that were um, headed by a black or African a woman, a woman paid the highest rent um, and yet were earning the second lowest monthly income. Um, we saw that our white male heads of household were earning the higher average monthly income and yet were paying the second lowest rent. So there was a higher rent burden um, on the uh, households who were headed by um, a, an African-American woman. And so we're really pleased to see, though, that um, of that group, 90% of those evictions were, um, were prevented. Um, some of the reasons that we saw why people were being evicted, um, about a third were due to landlord disputes or illnesses, um, a little over a quarter were due to financial issues, a quarter were due to job loss, um, and then about 13% were habitability issues. Um, what we tended to see was that when households were facing eviction due to issues with the landlord or, um, you know, uh, and th that could include things like, uh, you know, the landlord isn't repairing a unit that they're obligated to, things like that, or other, you know, interpersonal issues. Um, those were less often but almost always showed up um, for households that were headed um, by an African American. So, um, so we were seeing that there was this tension between landlords and, and households. Um, and and I, I should have led with this, but um, of the uh, households that we served, 68% um, were black or African American, um, over 50% were um, African American women. And then you can see at the bottom there, the total financial assistance that we provided was over $60,000. Next slide. To briefly talk about how then we launched, uh, secondly, our school-based family stabilization program, the concept was to provide housing services to vulnerable families with children who are identified by their school as experiencing homelessness uh, but not uh, eligible for HUD programs. So we, uh, many of you are familiar with McKinney-Vento and the education standards around homelessness. Um, so these these were targeting housing assistance to uh, students and their and their uh, guardians who were bouncing around or uh, experiencing housing instability. So our key partners there uh, to launch this pilot was a local school district who had um, strong uh, liaisons uh, to identify students experiencing homelessness. Again, a social services partner with strong expertise in rapid rehousing. Um, and, and fair housing. Uh, and then we also brought in a university research team to really track the progress and success of this. We wanted to take a look at the impact of housing stability on a child's lifelong learning potential. So we uh, hired the university to uh, track that for us. Uh, this was entirely privately funded uh, through an anonymous family foundation in our county, uh, and it was an 18-month pilot project. It began prior to the school year starting, and then um, the uh, on-the-ground work started in the beginning of the 2018 school year, and we were projected to serve about 10 to 15 households. Next slide, please. 
And Greg, again, will talk a little bit about the impact of the Sprout pilot. Uh, of note, this was just a pilot, and we are planning uh, to um, launch uh, this program again in partnership with a school district uh, utilizing an even stronger equity lens this time around. Yeah, so one of the lessons learned from this, too, was that, and before I get into some of the, the numbers here, um, you know, we were looking at mobility data and we were looking at uh, McKinney-Vento numbers and at the beginning of the project found that it was actually difficult to uh, get the numbers up on um, households that we wanted to serve. Um, and, you know, part of the reason for that was, was what we learned was that the McKinney-Vento list kind of has a cyclical, uh, cyclical nature to it and it, it's high at the end of the uh, school year and significantly lower at the beginning of the next year. So when we launched this project over the summer, uh, there were a number of families that we couldn't get in contact with or, um, you know, had moved out of, out of the region. Um, and so there was a little bit of a struggle at the beginning to, to start enrolling families. But we were eventually able to serve 40 children uh, in the uh, uh, 2018 um, academic year. Uh, we stabilized the housing situation for 15 of um, the households that we served and um, saw that 11 had moved into a new location, two were able to remain in their own home, um, and two needed only case management services to make their situation more tenable. So one of the other lessons that we learned was that we, we meant to launch this kind of built as a, you know, a rapid rehousing program. We do rapid rehousing really well, and we thought we'll do rapid rehousing, but as a prevention project. And, you know, quickly discovered that some of the households that we were working with weren't interested in or didn't really need a rapid rehousing style intervention. Um, and so luckily we were able to be flexible and, and adjust the program design, you know, on the fly to account for some of these other households that needed uh, other kinds of interventions um, in order to, um, you know, help uh, stabilize their situation as well. Thank you, Greg. And just in the interest of time, very quickly to go back to the beginning, there were three best practice recommendations in the Unlocking Door study. We are uh, looking to launch the third, which is a universal screening tool, but with targeted uh, prevention and emergency rent assistance. We are in the planning stages of that. We do plan to utilize ESGCB funding. Uh, we will be calling it an emergency rent coalition to make sure that all of our partners are at the table. There is an urgency to this work, especially because of COVID. Uh, we we certainly launched uh, the beginning sort of pilot of an emergency rent coalition to specifically target the Hispanic community in partnership with a nonprofit in our community that serves the Hispanic community and that actually early data in our community was showing is being impacted highly both economically and with high positive COVID cases. Um, and when we also partnered with uh, the Center for Social Innovation and did a full year way home equity evaluation, we found that the Hispanic community was often experiencing high rates of housing instability, overcrowding, um, but was not accessing our system uh, at Your Way Home due to cultural or linguistic barriers. So we utilize the urgency of that and our findings and uh, of our equity study to move fast on launching an emergency rent and housing stabilization program for the Hispanic community. Uh, but we are also trying to uh, expand the emergency rent program to be data informed, to be equitable, and to be impactful to utilize our CB funding. So uh, we're really excited to launch that within the next few months. Next slide. So just overall uh, homelessness prevention recommendations from Montgomery County and Your Way Home are things that have already been talked about during this webinar, but it is to use local data and voices to target prevention resources uh, geographically and demographically. Uh, be sure to formalize your partnerships, look outside of the housing and homeless service system uh, through cross-sector advisory teams and written procedures. Uh, we have always started our prevention programs with small pilot projects. Uh, we tweak and then uh, find uh, funding and support to bring it to scale. Um, and we are strong components of, of investing in research and evaluation to quantify the impact. Next slide. I'm going to hand it back to Norm. Thank you so much, Kaylee and Greg. Uh, great, great content there. And we had a lot of questions in the chat box. Uh, and uh, just I would echo Regina's comment that, like, it's amazing work you're doing. Thank you so much. So we have a lot of questions, and we're just going to dive into the questions here. So 
we'll take the hardest one first and hopefully it'll get easier from there. So we had a question about can you target a particular racial group for prevention resources? Uh, for the purpose of the question, I'm assuming you're uh, talking about HUD funding. Uh, you cannot target people based on their race with uh, prevention funding or actually with any HUD funding. However, uh, there are a lot of ways to look at this that you absolutely can do. Uh, neighborhood analysis uh, is definitely, uh, you know, looking at the racial composition of the neighborhoods you're planning to serve is definitely uh, something you can do. Um, looking at the, you know, the, the, the whatever prevention approach you're looking at, uh, the target populations, doing racial equity analyses of those uh, is definitely okay, as long as you're trying to address inequities. Uh, if you were trying to do that to promote inequities, I think you would have a fair housing problem. But if you're trying to address inequities, uh, then you can definitely do that kind of analysis of looking at, okay, who has, um, you know, which systems are serving more uh, black and indigenous people and people of color? Uh, w should we target those systems? Uh, evictions where a lot, you know, where people are disproportionately, who are being evicted are disproportionately black, indigenous, and people of color. Those are, uh, those are definitely okay strategies. However, if your project is uh, we will only serve uh, black or African-American people or we will only serve uh, indigenous, uh, Native American, less Native people, that would not be allowed. Um, there was a question earlier about is it okay to have a provider that you sub to that only serves one particular uh, racial group uh, and then, you know, you can still serve the same number of people but only send people to that provider if they're that particular racial group. That is also not allowed under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, however, you can certainly have providers who have expertise and who are sort of better known uh, in the, say, the indigenous community. Uh, you can definitely tell people that your uh, a program has the competence to serve uh, indigenous people, for example, or uh, has a particular cultural competence that they may be interested in. That's the kind of stuff you can do. Uh, but you couldn't deny someone access uh, if they weren't of that race or ethnic group. So hopefully I answered those questions. Uh, I think, you know, throughout this webinar, we have tried to provide not just what you can't do, but like specific examples of things that you can do that will uh, promote equity. And, um, and uh, we also have, I will say, a lot of resources that we are publishing. Uh, some are already out there, but uh, more are coming that will hopefully help give you some ideas about uh, steps you can take that will promote equity. Great. So moving on to another question here. Um, we have um, so we have a question about uh, looking at racial equity across a large geographic area like a state or a um, well a state or a large regional uh, COC, and this is obviously particularly of interest of, uh, for state recipients, and how do you promote equity across a very large geographic uh, area? I think we mentioned one example earlier is if you can look at overcrowding data in the various cities within your state. Uh, I don't think anyone publishes overcrowding data like at the zip code level, but there are definitely like metropolitan area uh, and um, I don't know what's smaller than metropolitan areas, but there is some data uh, at the census website and uh, at HUD's website. Uh, we'll try to look for uh, other resources like that as well that you can look at for those. Um, you, you can also, I, I don't know, like you can sort of, I, I think key informant interviews and talking to people who work in different communities uh, can be really helpful. Uh, looking at, again, the school data can be super helpful at targeting across uh, across a large, uh, large area, uh, and then looking at your homelessness data. I mean, where, you, where your homelessness populations are bigger are often where, you know, you're going to uh, see the bigger at-risk groups. Uh, we had a question. I wanted to, Kaylee, I wanted to, um, or actually, Kaylee or Greg, we had a question about the average amount you spend uh, 
Uh, and I think this is related to the EPIC program, but it would probably be helpful to know for both programs. I know you talked about a, a sort of a maximum of $1,500 in assistance under the EPIC program, but what, what was the average amount you uh, found you were spending? We found in our first year of the program that the average was about $1,200 per household. So it sounds like a lot of people were taking pretty much advantage of, of most of the uh, financial assistance. I mean, $1,500 is not that much. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, how about for the, uh, the your other, your school-based program? How do you know about how much assistance people were getting in that program on average? Can we go back to that slide real quick? I believe we have it on that slide. I was just going to say, I hope Taylor has the answer to that because I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> um, so, so, give me one second. Yeah, uh, Tommy Joe, I think, can we back up to one of the slides about the uh, program? I think it was, I'm going to say slide 34, maybe. We do also have a report that Kaylee wrote that we can post the link to in the chat. Okay. That includes uh, all of that information. I have information. to slide up here, actually. Looks like the total financial assistance was 75000 for uh, about 15 households and 40 children served. Uh, someone can probably do the math for us. There it is. Thank you. Um, so, about... Uh, <clears throat> Couple thousand dollars a household, it looks like. Does that sound about right? It does. And I, then, I, there was a large learning curve in our in our Sprout pilot for sure. There were um, families who needed much longer and and more intensive services, including financial assistance. Uh, there were some, as this slide mentioned, that really ju we off there was no financial assistance needed. They just needed housing stabilization, case management services, including landlord engagement and mediation and advocacy on their behalf. So um, you are correct in the quick math around the average. I will just sort of say that, uh, you know, sort of just learning from a small pilot, we found that it, it really did range uh, quite widely the amount of assistance needed. We did utilize a progressive engagement strategy to try to get the least amount of uh, resistance and, and reevaluate it every couple of months around their need for ongoing assistance. Yeah, and you talked, I think, a little bit about how I, uh, one of your learnings seemed to be that there were a lot of people who didn't need sort of a traditional rapid rehousing style intervention with rental assistance that they needed other things. Uh, and you've talked about, I think, mediation and sort of landlord engagement stuff. Can you sort of give some, like, what are some examples of the kinds of activities that you uh, were surprised about or, and maybe as some of our, as our audiences are developing these kinds of programs that they should really focus on making sure that they have, uh, that they're ready for? Absolutely. Your Way Home, uh, as a public-private partnership, we have a fiscal sponsor and do a lot of work engaging um, local donors in the uh, philanthropic community. Um, so we equip our rapid rehousing and housing providers with flexible private dollars and pair it with landlord engagement and mediation. So um, to jump forward just real quick a little bit, as we're planning our emergency rent coalition, sort of the third prong of our homelessness prevention assistance, we recognize that a really big part of that is not just the financial assistance, but how important it is to get uh, and fund staff that are knowledgeable in landlord engagement and mediation. Uh, this is a skill set that is different than housing case management, than traditional social work, uh, but it is real, we have found it to be really successful in uh, our prevention strategy and utilizing a progressive engagement approach to keep costs and financial assistance down and better target that prevention. So uh, we have our landlord, um, we call them our housing locators, uh, really uh, trained well in uh, PA landlord tenant law, tenant rights, um, and uh, landlord mediation. So if for the Sprat Initiative, they did a lot of work. Um, we were able to actually uh, just wipe out evictions by connecting 
by doing that mediation and offering some uh, flexible financial assistance to perhaps, uh, in one instance, we made repairs to the home that the landlord was very upset about that the, the damages had happened that exceeded the security deposit already. And just with a little bit of mediation, then uh, the landlord had agreed and, and proof that the family could continue paying rent going forward. Uh, the eviction was withdrawn and the family was stabilized. And it was very minimal amount. Um, and in fact, our housing locators also tend to have a bit of handy person experience uh, and sometimes just go in there and do the uh, repair work themselves a little bit. You got to be flexible, right? And uh, yeah. you do what it takes. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's great. Um, we had a question about what, uh, if you're thinking about secondary prevention, so we'll just talk about it as diversion. If you're thinking about diversion, uh, can you use ESG funding for diversion? Uh, the answer is an unqualified yes, you can. Uh, and there are some different ways to do that. And I'm just going to ask, um, Brad, if you could uh, chime in here, I think you're on the line, uh, and talk about some of the uh, activities that you can do with uh, ESG funds that are sort of parts of traditional, uh, traditional diversion programs. Sure, and Marlisa also weigh in, but ESG under homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing both can pay for arrears in housing if that will help stabilize somebody in their current housing or help them obtain new housing. We can pay for um, housing search um, and location. We can pay for housing navigators. We can, we can even pay for um, utility arrears. Uh, there are some limited, we can pay for short-term rental assistance going forward. Of course, when you do that, our one-year lease requirement kicks in. And anytime you use ESG services or financial assistance um, to pay for someone to keep a unit going forward, then habitability requirements kick in. Um, so we can pay for a lot of those services and rental assistance, just depending on what you use when will um, say whether or not additional requirements kick in. Would you add anything to that, Marlisa, or more specific examples? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. So yeah, just a um, couple of the more specific services, uh, like um, legal services, credit repair, um, all of these have to be, a mediation, all have to be tied to um, obtaining or maintaining housing, but those can also be used in a, in a diversion program. Yeah, and I think uh, just based on what Kaylee said, the, diver the uh, mediation activity is a really crucial part of this and uh, absolutely something you can find with, uh, with ESG resources. Uh, great, thank you so much. Uh, we have another interesting question that uh, I want to address really quickly. Um, so the question is, are there any suggestions regarding balancing the need to get uh, the, e the second round of ESG CV funding out and start quickly spending it uh, with not having a great handle on what things are going to look like three to six months from now uh, would be greatly appreciated. So if you, as you're planning, you have like, you know, obviously people want you to start, you have all this money, you should start spending it much quickly. Uh, HUD is also encouraging you to spend money quickly. Uh, and then, but you also like, no one knows where COVID is going. So uh, what, you know, what are some ways to think about that? Uh, so just a couple quick suggestions. First of all, um, there are a bunch of people right now in your communities that are in shelters that are really high risk of spreading COVID. Uh, Rehousing them is a good strategy, like right now. Uh, you should not feel at all inhibited about rehousing uh, people from encampments and from uh, shelters where their uh, people are in close quarters and at high risk of spreading COVID. Uh, that is something you can absolutely do now. Uh, the other thing I would say is that the, the diversion activity, uh, there is no chance that you are not going to like uh, uh, sort of want to do that. Uh, and uh, three to six months from now, you'll want to have that kind of program available and up and running. Uh, so I'd definitely encourage you to look at, uh, th those are both approaches you can definitely implement right now. Uh, 
Uh, and I think that will give you a, a really good start on, on, uh, on utilizing your CARES Act resources. Some of the other stuff takes more thought and more planning and uh, more work getting stakeholders together and identifying, uh, identifying partners you haven't worked with before, and that is going to take a little longer, and uh, we certainly understand that. And, uh, uh, but there are definitely, I think, activities you can jump on right now and, uh, and, and get going. Uh, we, uh, we had some question about uh, utilizing coordinated entry for prevention. Uh, so, uh, Brett, I wonder if you could walk us through what, are, what is the coordinated entry requirement for uh, utilizing prevention resources? Yep, so all ESG CV resources will be required to go through coordinated entry. Um, and then I think to save us time, since we only have five minutes left and still a ton of questions, I posted the link to office hours on May 29th, where we did a whole spiel on coordinated entry and ESG CV and went into some more detail. Um, and I would refer you back to that, but all, all of the ESG CV activities have to go through and be prioritized through coordinated entry. Yeah, I will, though, encourage people, and, and this is what you'll hear on the webinar, is, like, uh, there are simple ways to do this. First of all, your prevention coordinated entry does not have to use the same access points in the same process as your other coordinated entry, and for a lot of reasons, it just doesn't make sense for them to be the same. Uh, so you can definitely have a different process. Uh, and, you know, the, the main thing you want to be able to document is that you are sort of implementing things fairly and uh, and just document what you're doing and how you're making decisions about how much funding in rental assistance people are getting uh, and how you're selecting people for assistance. Uh, but it is absolutely okay to have a temporary uh, approach or a CARES Act approach. Uh, so, um, you know, again, go back to that webinar and, and uh, you know, I think one of our messages was to try to keep things very, very simple and straightforward. Uh, somebody just posted in the uh, chat box how you can download all of the chat window. So uh, uh, people may want to do that because there's a lot of great information here. Um, so uh, that that brings us about to the end of our time. Uh, looking through the remaining questions, we, you haven't left us with very many easy ones. Uh, so I just want to go back and. Uh, First of all, we will try to address some of these questions in future webinars and future products. Uh, we do have some prevention products that we'll be rolling out over the next few days. Please uh, subscribe to the listserv, and uh, we do a digest every twice a week with new resources. So um, uh, we have some great resources coming up, so stay tuned for those. I very much want to thank our presenters today. Um, I want to thank uh, Julie and Regina for giving us a nice a uh, really great overview of different prevention concepts and some examples. Uh, very much want to thank Haley and Greg for uh, giving us a fantastic presentation uh, on, on what you all are doing. We're uh, very excited to go back and read some of the resources on that and the reports on that that you have shared with us. I uh, want to thank uh, the TA providers and SNAP staff in the background who were helping to answer questions and working with logistics and everything. And again, I want to thank everyone who participated in the webinar. I know we covered a ton of content in a very short period of time. Uh, that is, I believe, the most prevention, homelessness prevention content that has ever been done in 90 minutes. Uh, so thank you for sticking with us. And uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Again, I want to thank you for the incredible work you're doing in communities. I am just consistently astounded by uh, how people are stepping up and uh, meeting the moment, not just on COVID, but on racial equity, on ending homelessness, uh, and just, you know, working together and just staying sane in these uh, incredibly, uh, to whatever this time is, whatever, whatever you uh, can call it. So thank you so much, uh, and we look forward to seeing you on Friday's webinar or our next webinar, and uh, that concludes our session today. Thank you.